All right. We are now going to have our Beyond Sustainability, Strengthening Climate Action and Resilience panel. Our panelists will have a chance to answer questions at the end of the presentation using Menometer. So get your questions ready and get them entered. Our panelists today, I think a couple are going to be virtual and a couple are going to be here with us. We'll, we'll find out. Our first panelist is Daniel Noah. Daniel is the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the National Weather Service Tampa Bay Area. Dan has worked for the National Weather Service for 33 years and has experienced firsthand the power of hurricanes during damage surveys of Hurricane Michael, which hit the Florida Panhandle in 2018, and Hurricane Ike in Houston in 2008. Our second panelist is Eddie Buza. Eddie is the Planning and Policy Administrator in the state's Resilient Florida office and serves as Champion of Leveraging for the Florida Floodplain Management Association. He previously served as Deputy Manager in the state's Office of Floodplain Management and as Zoning Planner and Growth Management Permitting Supervisor for Collier County. Next, we have Sarah Kane, who is familiar to many of you, Sustainability Program Supervisor for UF IFAS Extension here in Sarasota County. In this role, Sarah oversees sustainability improvements within government operations and the efforts to create a sustainable and resilient community across Sarasota County. She has worked in the environmental field for 18 years with positions at Sarasota Bay Estuary Program and Moat Marine Laboratory. Our next panelist is Chris Cucci. Chris is Senior Vice President and Chief of Staff at Climate First Bank, a values-based financial institution with a focus on environmental and social impact lending. Active in the community, Chris serves on the board of directors for CCIM, which is the Certified Commercial Investor Member Central District, and Osceola Community Healthcare Services, a federally qualified healthcare center serving the uninsured and underinsured populations in Osceola County. And finally, our final panelist is Dr. Harry, Dr. Terry Harpold. Dr. Har Harpold is an associate professor of English at the University of Florida and founder and director of UF's Imagining Climate Change Initiative. His teaching, research, and activism focus on intersectional understanding of climate crisis, addressing the roles of race, gender, class, indigeneity, and species, and the struggle for equity and justice, and the importance of the creative imagination in securing a compassionate and resilient future for a more than human world. Let's welcome our panelists to the stage and to the screen. And the clicker is right there. So let me get my all my stuff out of your way, and you can go first. <laughs> Okay, if you could cue the presentation. Heat and climate change. Uh, this presentation you can download and any of the links are clickable so you don't have to try to write them down fast or take a picture of the slide. Uh, so my name is Dan Noah and I work for Noah. And it gets better. I can issue flood warnings. So I have the biblical aspect of this as well. <laughs> so I work for the federal government under the Department of Commerce. And then it's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Under there, we got NOAA Fisheries and St. Pete Ocean Service. We're the Weather Service. And under the Weather Service, you see all these national centers. They paint the big picture of what's going to happen here in Sarasota County. And it's my office in Ruskin that paints all the small scale details. And we communicate that to decision makers in your county for the protection of life and property. These are all the offices across the country. We're all the same. It's a local forecast office. There's only 23 employees, 17 are meteorologists. The rest are technicians keeping all the equipment running at the airports and such. My last office was Bismarck, North Dakota 20 years ago. It got down to 46 below zero and we left. <laughs> so let's talk about the difference between weather and climate. Weather is what you wore today. Climate is what you have in your closet. Uh, but climates change and our clothes are going to change. And with the warming planet, there is, it's likely that we're going to have more extreme events. We may not have more events, but the events we do have will be more extreme. And uh, heat is one of those. Surprisingly, heat kills mo uh, more people than most other weather hazards. 
Um, so how do we know we're warming? We've been taking measurements since the late 1800s, uh, and we've been doing quality control checks on the instruments and the data, and it has gone over with a fine tooth comb, and we know that is happening. But let's look at fatalities, weather-related fatalities. Look at heat is way above everybody else, and heat is a preventable death. Now, where are these fatalities happening? We're hot here in Florida, but you don't hear about 800 fatalities. It's happening in places like Chicago that aren't used to the heat. They don't have air conditionings, possibly. And then the elderly and very young. Those are the ones that are mostly impacted. A study of Hurricane Katrina shows that sea level rise increased uh, the flood elevations 15 to 60 percent in Katrina. And as our sea levels continue to rise, you know, one foot of water could mean inundation or dry. And so any rise is, is not something that we want to see. And then the other side of that coin is where the water isn't. And we've seen uh, 40 million people are under uh, water threat in the western United States as Lake Mead continues to dry up. So let's take a look at uh, what are we looking for in the future here. This map shows that we expect the greatest increase of heat waves to be in the red areas. And you can see that South Florida and the west coast of Florida is included in this research study. And if you're interested, the link is on the bottom. Let's look at shorter terms. Let's not look at longer terms. Shorter terms, we are seeing an increase in big events. We had $20 billion plus events in 1921. And you can see the hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. And we got really lucky that year. Uh, Louisiana, not so much. But you've got the tornadoes and hurricanes. But look at the droughts and the fires in the West. They are suffering out there. And it's only going to get worse. Uh, this is where we are so far this year with our climate disasters, and you can see Ian is on there, uh, but we still have the droughts and fires and, and such. So the thing that I don't like about this slide is we had over 4,500 fatalities, and many of those could have been prevented. And uh, as we saw with Ian, we had over 120 fatalities in Florida, and how to reach those people that don't want to go, uh, that's what we're struggling with, and that's where our focus is going to be over the next couple of years. Ah, let's talk about our warning system in this country. We issue the warnings for hazardous weather, and we communicate that to emergency management. So Ed McCrane is the Sarasota County Director, and we talk to Ed and everybody, and every six hours as the storm is approaching uh, with Ian, we were doing briefings, and they were making decisions based off on those briefings. We rely on your local media to present the information to the general public. The National Weather Service does not have an app. We want you to download the media's app because they're the ones that are responsible for communicating the threat to you. And, of course, all of our stuff is online, too, and you can get it for free. But these relationships, what makes them so valuable, we had this tornado in January, uh, and it was just amazed there were no fatalities because a darn thing went through three large mobile home parks. And uh, if you want to look at the damage, look how skinny the damage was on that tornado. You had to be uh, almost really unlucky in this mobile home park to get hit by the tornado, and where it did hit, they had devastation. Uh, there are the mobile home parks, and the dots are where we plotted damage, and it actually went all the way into downtown Fort Myers. Uh, let's look at Ian, just real briefly. A really big wind field across the entire peninsula of Florida. Charlie did not look like that. Charlie's wind field looked like a 10-mile-wide F2 tornado. It did not have that big wind field. So we had a peak wind uh, from a weather instrument onshore, of 140 miles an hour at the Cape Coral Yacht Club. Now, if you think, uh, this is the track of Ian, and if you go counterclockwise, you can feel the wind pushing the water on shore, and that red area is where we expected over nine feet of storm surge. And we ended up with 10 to 15 feet. Uh, the final determination isn't been done yet. Rain. 
climate change is going to change where the rain falls in our country and around the world. And as our last presenter said, Middle East is experiencing the brunt of that. All of that rain runoff is causing a red tide bloom to come off of Sarasota, well, actually Mayaka and some other rivers. Uh, but that's all from the nutrients that are washing offshore. Uh, I did the survey in uh, Ian a uh, week after the damage, uh, and we couldn't even get to the islands yet. They were still doing search and rescue. Uh, but you can imagine that house. That's the depth of water. If it's moving, it's going to wash a house off its foundation. And you can see roads by Arcadia are flooded. Just the impact, how horrible that is. Uh, real briefly, what can you do? Have multiple ways to get your warning information. Uh, weather radio, get your favorite commercial app from your favorite media. I love this FEMA app. If uh, you get nothing else, download that FEMA app. It will help you recover from an event. Uh, you can be a force in nature. If you have an interest in climate and weather, and you do because you're here, you can sign up to be an ambassador for a Weather Ready Nation. Just go to weather.gov slash WRN, and that puts you on a special email list that we will send you once a month some resources that you can use to influence your peers to prepare for whatever event you want them to prepare for. So if it's heat, if it's hurricanes, uh, we give you these. You can even put your own logo over ours. We don't care. We just want the same message to go out in many ways as possible. And that is it for me. I'm going to go grab a seat and turn it over. Yeah, good. So I think I'm uh, up next. Hello. Um, my name is Eddie Bozo. I'm with uh, the Department of Environmental Protection in the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. And I'm going to give you a, a quick overview about the Resilient Florida program today. Um, go ahead and next slide, please. So the Resilient Florida program uh, started in 2021. It was uh, <clears throat> acknowledged by the legislature that um, a coordinated and statewide approach to uh, becoming more resilient and adapting to changing conditions um, is something that is important to the state. And uh, the program was created through uh, the legislature and, and uh, put in the department. And actually, uh, at the same time, sort of consolidated a lot of the coastal and aquatic area programs that DEP had. So it created the new Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection um, which is made up of about four other uh, beaches or uh, coastal protection programs like uh, clean marinas, clean boating, um, beach management funding for renourishment, and inlets, ports, and um, all, all those sections kind of put into one. Um, and this was a way to uh, not only help local governments uh, plan for and adapt to changing conditions, um, due to sea level rise or intensification of storms or um, that increased rainfall that was mentioned. Um, and it's a grant program primarily to help with planning and um, those adaptation and implementation plans. Um, go ahead, next slide. Um, the program went through a couple of changes. So if, if you had been tracking um, legislation uh, after year one, uh, some of those changes are highlighted here. I'm not going to spend too much time, but the biggest uh, the, the biggest change in 2022 was expanding eligible entities to special districts, flood control districts, water management districts, um, anybody that has the responsibility or maintenance of waterways, um, drinking water, wastewater facilities um, aren't always the local government, and sometimes those are special purpose governments. And so expanding the program to them is kind of the major change from 2022 and all. I'll leave that there for this. Next slide. I'm working to condense a, a longer presentation for you, so I am going to breeze over some things, but um, I'll, I'll go over what I think is most important. Um, this slide here just kind of shows some of the different areas of the program. Um, we've got the planning grant section. Um, we have funding for regional resilience entities. Uh, there's a statewide plan that we're in uh, the process of developing, and um, there's also a statewide assessment. So the state is actually going to conduct its own vulnerability assessment using data from local planning grants and other publicly available sources to determine uh, what critical assets of local government are at risk. Um, next slide. 
Uh, mentioned planning grants. So our primary planning grant opportunities are to conduct vulnerability assessments. Um, we're funding several projects in, in Sarasota area and um, you know Tampa Bay region um, as it pertains to assessing you know, what are their critical assets, what assets are at risk, um, and how do they prioritize their plans for adapting um, through projects. Um, those are fully funded grants through the state. Um, and we have a couple of uh, resources available. Next slide that might help with that. We've uh, developed in the past an adaptation planning guidebook, which kind of covers the process of the vulnerability assessment and the adaptation plans. Um, we've developed standard scopes of work that can be used to uh, build up your work plan with your contractor if you're going to bid. We also have some guidance on living shorelines uh, that can be used for project installations for as it pertains to like habitat suitability, different options that you might have in different scenarios. We also host a quarterly forum that if you're not uh, attending, uh, we bring speakers to discuss their resilience efforts, projects, success stories. Um, and then we also just provide general information about our grant opportunities uh, through webinars. Next slide. Regional resilience entities, we can uh, provide funding to these, They're primarily the regional planning councils to kind of tie together these multi-jurisdictional approaches um, or assist the local communities that might not have in-house capabilities. Uh, next slide. I mentioned the uh, statewide data set and assessment. We, we've collected information from local governments and we're um, relying on publicly available statewide federal sources of uh, critical asset data. And we're eventually gonna be working with the flood hub. So you can go to the next slide. Um, to develop our statewide assessment. The flood hub is based out of the University of South Florida and the College of Marine Science. Dr. Tom Frazier is the director of the flood hub and the, the flood hub is gonna do kind of three main things um, in, the, in this year. They're developing local Florida sea level rise projections. So um, comparing uh, some scientific studies and some data with what NOAA's put together, um, NOAA downscaled, you know, regional or global climate models and um, USF is going to look to make that more regional to Florida. Um, they're also going to be looking to work with the USGS on uh, future rainfall projections. Uh, so some of you may be familiar with Atlas 14 or the coming Atlas 15, which would have potential future precipitation numbers um, so that local governments can use that data in their assessments. Um, and they're also putting together other working groups to discuss flooding and, and sea level rise initiatives. Next slide. Um, so the resilience plan that I mentioned is, is essentially at this point, it's projects that we're funding. Next slide. Um, and in year one, uh, we funded two different sort of pots of, of projects. They were all evaluated on the same criteria. We had some federal money that was available to us and some state money, and you can see the breakdown there of some of the projects, a lot of stormwater management, uh, installing nature-based solutions or living shorelines, critical facility retrofits. Um, and go to the next slide, I'll show you some of those funding amounts that were available. In year one, um, we funded uh, nearly $400 million in projects uh, from federal dollars and uh, $270 million in statewide uh, flooding and sea level rise plan projects, um, two million for regional resilience entities, and then we funded some activities with Flood Hub. So um, you can see some of the expected amounts at the bottom there um, that were from 22, 23, and and we hope to even you know do more beyond. Next slide. Um, so in the last two minutes or so that I think I have, um, I just wanted to kind of talk um, next steps. Oh, sorry. Um, missed the slide there. This this was just kind of an overview. This was for you to kind of go back and look at later, a different way to look at that table that you were just on. Next slide. Um, so what can you do? And um, I know that there's a lot of different stakeholders in, in the workshop and there's potentially local governments, potentially designers, engineers, contractors. Um, you know, local governments get planning grants. You know, our portal, um, you can stay on that slide actually, the, the grant cycle. Yeah, so, um, you know, Learn more about our program, find out what kind of projects we fund, submit for uh, grants for planning and implementation. This is an outlook for next year, July 1st. We'll open the portal for a couple months to get projects and um, we'll in the lead up, we'll have a lot of workshops and, and Q&A sessions. Um, if you're a contractor, 
you know, a lot of these local governments are going to bid, they're going to contract for these types of services. Call us, find out what kind of projects we can fund, see if there are things that you can do. Um, so maybe you have existing continuing services contracts with communities that you can leverage, uh, you know, our funding source to, to match their dollars to get projects done. If you're a designer, um, these projects, they get points based on their readiness to proceed. So, um, you know, maybe you front load some design for a local government so that they can submit it with their application. They get more points, they get funded. And, um, you know, that's a way to stand above the rest is to have that design element completed already. Um, homeowners, you can go to your local governments, your boards or workshops, see what they're doing, see what kind of resilient funds, uh, resilient Florida funds that they're looking for and trying to get. These are grant opportunities that are state level opportunity that would compete on a national level in the number of dollars, the size, um, but you've got that applicant pool that's just Florida and you're not competing with FEMA and all those hazard mitigation grants. So really want to take opportunity of this. Um, if you go to the next slide, I believe it has my contact information and i um, happy to talk more about this, but I think my time's up for now. So thanks. Great, hello everyone. Thank you so much, Eddie, for giving an overview of the Resilient Florida Grant Program. It's really exciting and unprecedented for our state. So I'm just going to uh, give a quick overview of the why uh, we're talking about this today, some issues at the local level. Um, and I definitely want to address Ian and some of the things that we just experienced because it's very relevant for the timing. The economics uh, and the importance of resiliency planning and then talk about some of our projects. So these are some uh, good pictures of um, Ian. Um, devastating pictures. However, this goes back to the why of why we're here talking about this today and how important it is. You can see some of these local pictures of what we just experienced. So I'm glad we're all here together today to talk about these things because it really does take the entire community to come together uh, to rebuild and to rebuild more sustainable and more resilient. Sure, that video is going to come up there, um, but this is just a picture of the Mayaka River. Thank you. Very impactful, as you can see, for Mayaka River area. So it's not just coastal flooding that's happening. As you can see, it's riverine flooding, uh, inland areas that were affected by Ian, and it's something that we all need to come together and address and look at and become more resilient. So you had uh, one of these pictures on your slide. <laughs> we need to talk about the economics of this. So 56 is the number of weather and climate disasters in the US in the past three years, with losses exceeding 1 billion. 2.155 trillion, the total uh, cost of damages from weather and climate disasters from 1980 to 2021, just in the US alone. And with the assessments ongoing, it's anticipated that the economic losses from Hurricane Ian will reach well into the billions. And you've probably seen um, this sea level rise gauge from St. Pete, St. Pete um, our local area, and just showing the sea level rise in our area over many years. So how are we addressing sustainability commitments in Sarasota County and, and just locally here? We started our sustainability office in 2002, which was really early on for a local government county to start looking at these issues. Our focus since then has been on a lot on mitigation and we're trying to um, look at adaptation as well now. But as you can see, um, we, we focus a lot on energy uh, reduction, climate pollution reduction in our buildings. So we have a green building resolution and all of our new county buildings are green certified. Um, most of them are LEED certified. That's USGBC uh, Leadership in Energy and Efficiency Design. And so that means that they're using less water, energy, um, and uh, they're better 
um, long lasting buildings that use less energy. So like I said, we focus a lot on mitigation. I think we need to look at both mitigation and adaptation when we're looking at resiliency. Um, so in the county, we um, have 48 electric vehicle charging ports in 22 locations. Uh, we have our charge up rebate program, which is uh, rebate infrastructure for electric vehicles uh, for businesses and nonprofit organizations. We've also really tried to reduce our energy usage in our buildings. So look, uh, using an energy performance contract to reduce our energy use. Um, also installing um, solar PV. We have four uh, locations right now that have solar PV on our buildings and we have more planned in the future. Also, like I said, all of our new county buildings in construction are green certified. Most of them are US GVC lead. We also have a green globes. And Lee Hayes talked a lot about this this morning, our energy and water commitments in the community. That's really important to us, the education and outreach we do in the community, um, especially for underserved community members. So since 2010, we've been able to do a lot just through grant projects. So we've had over $7 million in grant funding to complete our energy and water efficiency projects. And uh, like Lee Hayes mentioned, we have our energy upgrade program, our Partners for Green Places program. We also have incentives for fast track permitting for green buildings in the community um, and also encourage waste reduction and carbon sequestration. And we also need to look at adaptation, mitigation and adaptation. So reducing climate pollution and addressing these issues that we're already facing with flooding and sea level rise. So we completed a sea level rise vulnerability assessment. It was an internal report that we worked on with our GIS professionals in the county. We completed that in 2020. That was kind of our first look to see how our assets are doing and how they're gonna be aff affected by uh, sea level rise and flooding. So we came up with some recommendations through that analysis to integrate sea level rise considerations in our planning efforts we joined the regional uh, Tampa Bay Regional Resiliency Coalition in 2020. And we also decided we need more analysis. We need a little bit more studies. We also want to do projects. <laughs> um, and we need more engagement and education in the community. And we also want to do a community-wide study. And in 2021, uh, we did receive a grant from the DEP to do a coastal analysis. So we have that done, but we also received the planning grant from Resilient Florida program that Eddie was just talking about. So we're really excited about that. And here are a few more things that we've done. So the community rating system is an incentive program offered by FEMA, um, and it gives opportunities to communities to participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. And it gives uh, counties and residents of our county um, flood insurance discounts if we address sea level rise. So we're looking uh, to get a higher classification for that, which will reduce uh, insurance rates. Uh, we also completed a post-disaster redevelopment plan and an emergency services unified local hazard mitigation plan. And the DEP uh, program, the Resilient Florida Planning Grant is so exciting because this level of funding and initiative coming from the state is unprecedented, but it's also allowing us to work together um, as a local community, both local governments um, and community groups to really look to see, um, to look at our assets and how we can plan to be more resilient. And it's really exciting because there's also a pot of money for projects. So after we're done with this planning part of it, we're gonna be working with a consultant and we'll have to identify our assets. We'll have a, a list, a prioritized list that we can use to apply for additional funding. And I really wanna stack those opportunities because we wanna take advantage of all the funding that's out there right now. So some of our work plan tasks for this is countywide vulnerability assessment and plan and that adaptation and resilience part of it is gonna be key, having that list of projects that we can apply for. And working, um, currently working with all of our internal departments, which is a lot, um, to try to coordinate efforts in the county for resiliency and to apply for some of this uh, project money. 
and then also coordinating with the cities regionally. So I just want to give you a snapshot of um, what's happening because basically all of our counties and cities in this entire region are doing these plans. Um, so the city of Venice received money, city of Northport, town of Longboat Key, and the city of Sarasota. And we've all gotten together um, and just talked about this and we're trying to coordinate efforts with our consultants for these plans. And then also Manatee County as well. So Manatee County is doing this in all the cities um, in the Tampa Bay region and also the South Florida region. It's really exciting because it's gonna allow us all to work together to really start addressing these issues on a deep level. We, we never had this kind of funding before. So having this now is really gonna allow us to coordinate efforts more. And we also um, do education. Education and outreach is so important um, for our community and for our department extension in the county as a whole. So we, we do all sorts of classes. If you're interested, all of these classes that um, have to do with sustainability and climate change and youth engagement, we're trying to um, do more with youth. So regionally, there's also not only local governments, cities uh, that are trying to address this, but also we have the Tampa Bay Regional Resiliency Coalition. We have the Sarasota Manatee Climate Council. The Patterson Foundation just started a, a new initiative called the Higher Waters Initiative, and they're bringing in stakeholders from across the community um, to come together and, and talk about this and also be a platform for information, which is great. The Sarasota Bay Estuary Program has done climate work. Uh, there's also a Southwest Florida Regional Resiliency Coalition and the Climate Adaptation Center. I know I'm out of time, but I'm almost done. This is my last slide. Uh, so new and future priorities, working together with all the internal departments to apply for the Resilient Florida grants, uh, the stormwater environmental utility rate projects, that's exciting. Um, there's also a Sarasota Bay watershed plan that just came out. We're currently doing a greenhouse gas emissions inventory and a lead for cities certification. And then we'd like to update our sustainability and resilience plan. Uh, we're working on a county electric vehicle analysis report right now, a solar assessment and expansion on solar, and energy efficiency conservation block grant that's coming out of the infrastructure bill funding. And we're also looking at new uh, grant opportunities and to coordinate regionally. So thank you so much. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for joining today. So I'm Chris Cucci with Climate First Bank, and uh, it's great to be here with you. Um, I wanna share a little bit about what our team has done in the past year or so. Uh, operating as a for-profit business with a focus on promoting social and environmental impact in the community. And I wanna be clear, I'm not here to uh, advertise the bank today, but more to present us as a case study in how the business community can look to address environmental issues. Um, so I'll share a little bit about we are. Can you go to the next slide? Um, so, you know, uh, first off, uh, just to give you a little idea about the bank, Climate First is a newly chartered bank. We opened our doors in June of 2021, just a little over a year ago. And the bank is registered as a benefits corporation. Um, we're also working with B Labs on a pending B Corp certification. And then we also partner with several third party organizations, such as the Global Alliance for Banking on Values and Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials. Uh, the thought there is that it helps keep us true to our mission and to use the influence of non biased third parties to maintain authenticity in everything that we're doing in our operations. Um, so the bank currently operates two branches in um, St. Petersburg and in Winter Park, Florida, just outside of Orlando. And we have plans for a couple more locations. All of these are, are LEED Platinum certified buildings. However, the bank's primary strategy is, is a digital forward approach. Um, and in fact, our, our fastest growing branch is our digital branch, which is a combination of your typical online access banking um, with the ability to speak to a live person. So there's a live banker working over video conference, kind of like I am today talking to you, no matter where you are in your home or in your office. 
Um, and that's kind of twofold, that idea. Obviously, it, it's a convenience feature, um, but it's also for us a, an efficiency uh, in that we're trying to, uh, you know, aspire. Well, we're not aspiring. We're actually achieving a, a net zero carbon business. Um, and we want to do that with uh, an avoidance for carbon credits or carbon offsets as possible. It's a lot easier to do that when you aren't building a bunch of brick and mortar. Um, so the idea of the bank is that we're, we're built on this idea that where you bank matters. And it's not just about the things that your bank is doing um, to influence positive change in the community. But sometimes more important is what a bank will not do. So there's a lot of banks out there nationally, uh, some of the biggest in the world, um, that are touting the green financing projects that they're doing. And ESG has become a pretty big buzzword in the uh, Wall Street world today. Um, but at the same time, a lot of these banks are doing things that are environmentally and socially harmful. So what we've worked hard to do is, to avoid that same pitfall is to develop uh, an extensive exclusionary list of industries and projects that we won't support. And this includes things like extractive industries, bad agriculture, uh, dirty energy, for-profit prison system, several other categories. Um, every day we're working out there to educate the public on how they can make an impact simply by putting their money in a bank that aligns with their values. Because uh, you know every dollar you deposit ends up being redeployed into the community. So we try to teach people every day that, that really where they put their dollars makes a difference. We can go to the next slide. And outside of policy, um, the next way that a for-profit business can make impact is through the services that they offer. Now, uh, I'll share our example that, you know, we do a lot of what I call mission agnostic business. Um, so if somebody comes to us and they're a small business owner, let's say they, they own an insurance agency and they wanna build an, a, a new office building, we'll consider that loan. Um, and we'll likely offer them terms that are gonna be competitive with what any other bank in town would offer them. But we also use this as an opportunity to educate and to consult, talk with that business owner on the benefits, both uh, social and financial of sustainable construction. So we show people how they can build a more energy efficient building, lower their carbon footprint, and at the same time, um, you know, that initial high investment or slightly higher investment will lead to reduced energy expenses that'll save significant amounts of money over the long term. And when our customers do elect to go with a LEED or a Florida Green Building certified project for their construction, we're gonna provide them with better loan terms, uh, including like lower interest rates, higher loan amounts. So that further incentivizes people to do the right thing. So it's kind of that combination of education and incentives that we see moving the needle. And we try to not only encourage this every day, but measure it um, to hold ourselves uh, you know, true to our mission. So we look at the carbon impact of our loan portfolio and we're trying to move the needle all the time by doing more and more um, in sustainable and, and environmentally resilient lending. And along with that, we offer products that uh, you know expand beyond a typical community bank, things like solar loans for commercial and consumer um, customers, EV charging infrastructure loans. So we're really trying to build out that network of EV charging, initially now across Florida and eventually nationwide. And then special programs um, to provide green energy uh, renovation financing for condo and homeowner associations, which I'll talk about in a moment. Like I mentioned earlier, the lead in Florida green building loan programs that we offer for homeowners and for commercial uh, businesses. And then we also offer some interesting social banking products to help promote social and environmental causes in the community. Um, so you go to the next slide just quickly. These are this one and then the next one after this. That's just a couple examples of some of the things I just talked about. And then if we'll go to the next slide here, this is uh, kind of interesting our, and it's pretty topical right now, especially in Florida, um, green community association lending. So there was a condo boom in Florida in the 1980s. And many of those condos are going through right now a 40 year structural recertification process. That's gonna be going on throughout this decade. Um, We've looked at this and decided, hey, this is a great opportunity to go in and start to talk to the condo associations and oftentimes through condo association managers about the opportunity to consider green energy retrofits. So while they're looking at doing all this renovation work and structural improvement work, we're recommending that they consider things like storm hardening, um, upgraded insulation, energy efficient windows, low flow plumbing, um, LED lighting, you know, all of these things that can make a difference for the future, um, not just for the building, but also for the, the planet. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you go to the next slide, um, the green energy certified construction and renovation. So this is something again, that we've basically incorporated into all of the traditional loan products that people walk into a community bank and ask for. So whether it's a home loan or that small business looking for their first building that they want to stop renting and start buying, 
Um, we're having these conversations all the time. And this really is something where we rely on partnership. Um, we, we couldn't do it all alone and we're not, we're not contractors, so we don't know all the ins and outs, but what we do is we engage partners in the community. So we've leveraged the Florida Green Building Coalition and we're talking with those contractors and architects all the time who are helping us and helping our customers to educate them on how they can do these things. And if you go to the next slide, please. Um, something I want to point out, because I think it's really important to the mission if we talk about environmentalism, is social good. Because we know um, it's a fact that low to moderate income communities are disproportionately uh, impacted by the negative effects of climate change. And people in low to moderate income communities often live in less energy efficient homes and end up paying higher energy expenses per square foot because of it. So yes, we can change this by helping them with some of the things I mentioned, the energy retrofits and whatnot. But a lot of the improvement really comes from helping with their upward financial mobility. And to do that, we need to look at the community around the homes, not just the homes themselves. So this is where we support loans that provide better access to childcare, um, health food, healthy, you know, healthy food, financial education, workforce development. And all of these things hopefully provide a lift to those in need within the community um, that can help them to you know, create a healthier and better environment. And then Outside of just low to moderate income communities, we also support environmental efforts, of course, working with environmental nonprofits. And sometimes we can't do that because we still are a traditional bank, we're regulated, um, and sometimes those projects just don't underwrite you know, for a traditional bank loan. So in those instances, we leverage the support of our small but growing nonprofit that we formed, which is the Climate First Foundation. And uh, just as an example, um, a few months ago, earlier this year, we actually worked with the, uh, in your market, in the Suncoast Urban Reforesters Organization on their um, Colony Cove microforest. So through the foundation, partnership with our bank, we were able to provide support in the form of a grant to the foundation. And then we also sent uh, several of our team members down who are excited to go down to uh, Ellington, Florida, and joined as volunteers in a planting effort for a one and a half acre microforest. The bank supports volunteerism. We try to promote this within our um, company by providing all of our team members with paid time off throughout the year, which they can be used uh, specifically for volunteer work in the environmental space. We just hope that this encourages people to walk the talk and do good for the community. So we're trying to give them that time away from work, away from you know making money for the bank and for our shareholders to do things that just impact the community around us. So I hope I've conveyed some passion today. I'm really excited about what we're doing here. It's pretty unique. I've been in banking 20 years and until now had never worked for a company that was this focused on doing more than just making money in the banking world. Um, we've built a unique team of bankers and ESG professionals at the bank, and we're working to do more than just grow a business. So, um, you know, like our friends at Patagonia say, we are doing well by doing good. And we hope that other businesses in Florida will take notice of this and will join us to become a true community partner. So I'm always looking to talk with other business owners and would love to connect one-on-one -on -one with anyone who ever has any questions about it. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Um, Slight change in style, I think, at this point. Um, I, I am, as Arlene mentioned, I am a professor of English at the University of Florida, and I am the founder and director of this, Imagining Climate Change, uh, which is an initiative that brings together artists, humanists, scientists, and the public in the vital work of imagining our collective climate futures. We sponsor colloquia, performances, film screenings, a symposia. If you just go to that URL, you'll be able to uh, find out about what we do. I want to begin today with two propositions whose implications are far-reaching. First, storytelling is the oldest, the most sustainable and resilient human technology. And second, we've been telling stories about changing climate for a very long time. The ancestors of Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples left Africa in the late Pleistocene epoch about 75,000 years ago. About 10,000 years later, they arrived on the Australian continent. At the end of the last glacial period, uh, 11,700 years ago, the peoples on the mainland were cut off from other human populations when the vast ice sheets of the northern and southern hemispheres began to melt and the Australian landmass was encircled by rising seas. This map uh, shows the extent of the changes, 
The yellow border shows the coastline before the waters rose, the darker interior where the rise tapered off 7,000 years later. The post-glacial world posed immense challenges to the peoples who had settled near the coasts, away from the continent's arid interior. In the space of a few thousand years, sea levels rose by as much as 400 feet, and shorelines receded by hundreds of miles. Islands near to shore disappeared. Peninsulas became island chains. Freshwater deltas were engulfed by ocean waters. We know from extensive archaeological evidence that the Aboriginal peoples were forced to move inland to higher and drier ground. And we know that they created stories to tell what was happening, each other what was happening to them. Anthropologist Patrick Nunn, and this is his image, um, has called these the oldest true stories in the world. He and his team have identified 21 sites on the periphery of the mainland where ancient tales, which we, not they, but we, formerly termed flood myths, uh, were in fact accurate descriptions, albeit in non-scientific language, of the local effects of a 5,000-year in inundation of their continent. The post-glacial changes were also reflected in Aboriginal art of the period. On the left is the Rainbow Serpent, an important and still very important water and rain deity that first appeared 6,000 years ago in rock paintings like this one in Arnhem Land Northern Territory. Anthropologist Paul Tasson has proposed that the serpent's anatomy is, in ba is based on that of the ribbon pipefish on the right, Haliichthys taniophorus, a saltwater species found off the continent's northern coasts. Pipefish like this would have been carried in by the inland incursion of seawater. And Tasson's insight is that the rainbow fish, rainbow serpent, excuse me, represents the origin story of a creature that the Aboriginal peoples had never seen before. It became their emblem for the new ecosystem that they were now forced to live in. And it did so in a way that made sense within their cosmology and their social order and still plays an important role in the stories they tell each other and their children. And it satisfied that need without a notionally objective, rational, dispassionate framework that we would consider to be scientific. But it was still deeply true. We have much to learn from the ingenuity and the durability of Aboriginal storytelling in response to our radically changing physical world. And their methods represent a powerful alternative to strategies that climate educators and activists often use. We, who were raised in an age of techno-scientific hubris, we rely on these methods to describe a world that is now in extreme transformation and one for which we are poorly prepared. I believe that we write, rely too much on dispassionate signs and symbols, we call them data, or their display in numbers and graphs. Those have their place in our mission, but our dependence on them ignores other long-established best practices for making meaning out of experience. Because I take seriously the observations of my colleague and friend, the brilliant young Australian scholar of climate anxiety, Blanche Verley, stories are connective and affective. They activate our emotions. They form the basis of complex ideas and symbols that reach profoundly and lastingly into our imaginations. And statistics and graphs do not do so, or not as well. For example, this. this is a graph of the average global CO2 levels over the last 800,000 years. It's based on the composition of Antarctic ice cores. As you see, for the most part, the levels have risen and fallen, but they've remained between 200 and 300 parts per million. Apart from, as you see on the very far left over there, um, the uh, catastrophic uh, dramatic rise of the last two and a half centuries. That very thin blue line is where we live now. Or this, the rise of CO2 from 310 to 420 parts per million from 1945 to the present, the period climatologists call the Great Acceleration, when every measure of humanity's impact on the planet has skyrocketed. But it's hard to communicate to people, to my students, for example, what these numbers can mean to them. What is it like to live in such a radical physical transformation of the world? So some time ago, I landed I'm talking about these numbers, on a method of asking them to use graphs like this to compile family carbon biographies. I said, go find the CO2 levels near the birth dates of your grandparents, your parents, your siblings, your nieces and nephews. Leave off the calendar birthdays. Just record the carbon birthdays as a measure of passing time 
and a proxy for parallel changes of the planet's ecosystem. You get something like this. This is my family's story. This is the beginning of a story, if you know how to connect the dots. It's a version of the most deeply rooted story of human experience, laden, as we all know, with melodrama, sorrows and joys, losses and consolations. It's a story about the world in which persons from four human generations, only four, who have experienced one measure of planetary change greater and more rapid than any during the last 8,000 centuries can be together in the same place at the same time in each other's fearful and hopeful embrace. It's the beginning of a new and a passionate story of our family and the wider human family. Now, it's an understatement to say that my students are impressed by this exercise, alarmed, dispirited, anguished, they see how little time has passed for so much change. But the exercise can be also, I insist to them, a basis for giving new meanings to their lives at the tipping point and new canons of storytelling that open into envisaging, as we must, how in a coming world, their world, of 600 or 800 parts per million or a three or four degree Celsius rise above pre-industrial levels, we may still find the exuberant resolve to transcend the present and imagine vital and loving futures. I don't uh, pretend um, that these carbon biographies will be as enduring as aboriginal myths of rising waters and new deities. Uh, those people, theirs is the oldest continuously active human culture. Um, we're a little late to the performance, but we can try. I think such methods of reimagining and restoring a world share with the ancient myths fundamental truths of narrative that we must embrace and foster in everyone. And we know these truths because we tell stories to our children. We tell stories to each other. Students come to my class to read and think about stories. Storytelling liberates the imagination. It engages our collective emotional vitality. It fosters more nuanced and ethical reflection and greater resolve to act with purpose. It prepares us, and this is the most important thing we must do for our younger charges. It prepares us for crossing the horizon of disaster and finding new ways of being and living in the aftermath. So in closing, I have this simple proposition a forecast of the range of our responses in a world that is coming and is already upon tens of millions of our sisters and brothers and numer numerous, numberless excuse me, individuals of other species. In the coming century, we will need new practices of storytelling and new stories about changing climate, new proto-stories of the real conditions of the passing generations and what they give to each other and new ways of extending those stories into, yes, myth, enduring, lasting myth. We're going to need new ways of entangling the physical traits of the world in unprecedented transformation to the cultural and imaginative elements of our lives and our civilization, new ways of expressing the endurance of the human spirit beyond the horizon of loss and grief. In short, We'll need new ways of making meaning out of unprecedented experience. We're going to need new rainbow serpents. Thank you. Oh, that was a great panel. Thank you. A lot of information there, diverse information. So if you have any questions, you want to enter them into Mentimeter. And if they're addressed to a specific speaker, please include the name. So we'll start. Oh. All right. Ultimately, will the lack of available no reinsurance create climate migration away from Miami and South Florida? Daniel was nodding. Would you like to address that, Daniel? <laughs> That was actually <laughs> based, that's saying Sophia Kiani, but I don't know. I'll, I'll give you my opinion on I that have a question. Uh, the only reason people live nor, near the coast is because of 
things like flood insurance. Uh, I, I don't think we should have flood insurance. <laughs> I think people should just <laughs> pay for where they live. Yeah. There's always, after that, that disaster, you know, we'll rebuild stronger, we'll rebuild better, and maybe it's a chance to ask, say, maybe we shouldn't rebuild there at all, right? And, and with that said, <laughs> buy flood insurance if you need it. <laughs> yeah. um, so, um, is Chris still with us virtually? So, Chris, I have a question for you. Um, in August, Governor DeSantis passed a resolution uh, directing uh, the state of Florida's fund managers not to use ESG criteria in terms of investing with the pension fund. And then it says in the same press release he sent out that in the next legislative session, they would amend Florida's deceptive and unfair trade practices statute to prohibit discriminatory practices by large financial institutions based on ESG social credit score metrics. Uh, can you just respond to that? Yes, and we have res we've responded publicly, and we've been advocating through every channel that we can that um, this is an infringement on on private uh, business to do what what business wishes to do. So, um, you know, we we do have issue with that. Um, that. You know, not without even getting into the virtues of what we believe it is, and it, the ESG thing in itself. Um, you know, I think that can be kind of twisted and. Um, just like green, the greenwashing concept in corporate America, these things can be um, misused, you know, but it's, it's not about that to us. It's about the spirit of what those concepts mean. And um, we don't believe uh, as a bank, and, and I think as individuals working for a bank, that there should be any penalty on us for making a decision based on a loan customer's um, you know, environmental stance, the way that they behave, uh, they're, they're, when you talk about their governance standards, um, these are things that we should consider just like we consider credit worthiness and we consider the character of a borrower in repaying. Um, we're stewards to our customers' dollars and to our shareholders' dollars, and they're invested with us and people are banking with us because they want us to support a specific set of values. Um, so for, for a um, you know, government to step in and tell us how we can or can out, cannot um, you know, deploy our own dollars or the dollars of our stakeholders, uh, something we just don't agree with. Did Sarasota County's post-disaster re redevelopment plan update tackle questions of where, how, and if to rebuild in place? Sarah? Yes, so the uh, original, the first post-disaster redevelopment plan was um, done approximately um, eight, ten years ago um, and did identify areas um, where we're going to see flooding, more flooding, and it, it did identify areas in, like, not just the coastal systems but also the inland systems as well, like we saw with Hurricane Ian. Um, and then just a couple years ago, the, it's the Planning and Development uh, Services Department that um, has done the post-disaster redevelopment plan and the update. So the update was done um, a couple years ago, and they um, kind of tried to um, get all the plans kind of together because there's a lot of different plans. So there's post-disaster redevelopment plan, there's um, the resiliency plans that we're talking about, and there's the local mitigation plan try to combine all of those and um, then identify certain actions in each different section. So I don't have um, a lot of information on that, but I can definitely, whoever asked that question, I can um, refer you to uh, Rachel and Joe and our Planning and Development Services um, team, and they can ask or answer specific questions to that. Okay. Terry, are you aware of any Florida Native American storytelling re-environmental change? Um, I'm aware of a great deal of archaeological evidence that shows uh, the adaptation of, of, um, of archaic peoples in Florida, right? We know that. And we know something about, I'm thinking about the work of my, my very brilliant colleague at UF, Ken Sassaman, who's been working on looking at the movement of, of, of archaic peoples back and forth from the shore as the waters rose and, and fell. So I can't speak directly to the Native American storytelling. I do know that there are people who are working in this area and um, more generally addressing, but look up Ken's work, Sassaman, S-A-S-S-A, what, Sassaman, S-A-S-S-A-N, a M A N. 
Ken has, has really done some tremendously good, uh, good work in this area. Um, but I do, think, I do think that more generally, um, the, the practices and storytelling of indigenous peoples who have undergone climate crisis before our time is very valuable to us. I've, obviously, I talked about the aboriginal peoples in the, uh, of Australia. But um, Patrick Nunn, the, the archaeologist, I mean the anthropologist whose work I mentioned before, has also been looking at oral flood narratives from other cultures that lived on the perimeter of the other continents and is finding sort of an uncanny resemblance of those narratives, which had previously been dismissed as mere flood myths, right, the creation myths and so on. But the uncanny relevance and precision of those stories to the, the geological data that we now have. So we, we could always learn from um, these ancient peoples who have been through this before and who um, survived and even thrived in crucial ways. For, F, for DEP funding grants to implement resiliency projects is great, but only half the solution. What is the DEP doing on the regulation side to decrease harmful but permitted projects? Um, so I have a limited exposure to the regulatory side uh, of the agency. I do know that there's some rulemaking going on now that's going to be looking at pollutant levels and, and revising some of those standards. Um, but if you'd like to reach out to me and I can connect you with some of those groups, um, they're just they're housed out of a different building and, and we have limited interaction. We do um, share our propose projects with our regulatory folks to um, maybe identify projects that could be problematic when it comes to permitting. Um, but other than that sort of collaboration, I don't have a lot of interaction on that side of the agency. Terry, I have a question for you. I wonder with your focus um, on intersectionality, have you found an impact from the recent education legislation that's been passed at the state level? I was worried somebody would ask me this. Um, yes, this, uh, okay, here, uh, there's short and long answers. The short answer is that there is absolutely no question for me in the classroom that my students want to talk about this. I look across their faces, I listen to what they say, this brilliant mix of colors and shapes and identities of all kinds. They understand that the brutal reality of climate injustice in the world and indeed the effects of climate crisis as they are felt are influenced by, overdetermined by, and intersect with gender, race, indigeneity, class, the consequences of, of colonialism, and so on. We can't responsibly talk about the world that approaches us without recognizing, as I said before, that tens of millions of our sisters and brothers who are subject to some of these intersectional forces are already bearing the effects of it. Well, we can't talk about the future that's coming without also addressing how we got there and what other contested identities that are being challenged by these new, our ability to speak about them are being challenged by these new educational laws. We can't, simply can't do, we simply can't talk about it without talking about them. So we have to find ways to, um, to, main, to, to resist creatively and to find opportunities for honesty um, in the classroom, um, we have to find ways to protect faculty and graduate students who are researching and working in this area, particularly those who do not have the benefits of tenure or institutional stability, right? Because they will be the easy targets for those that think that we're indoctrinating young people. Um, and we have to find ways to respect the desires of those young people to have frank, open, and consequential conversations about the lives that they live, the lives that their families live, the lives that those they love live. And if we don't do that, then we will have, we will have failed them badly. I, I, I do expect a difficult time um, in the coming couple of years, um, and I don't have an easy answer for that. Yeah. Thank you for that. And thank you to all of our panelists.